So in this next example, we have a medical office spends $12,000 on a diagnostic machine and profits $135 per use of the machine. So here, let's look at the changing quantities that we have and the representation of each of them. Is one depending on the other or is one affected by the other? So if we look at here, we have money and then we also have use of the machine. And in fact, it's not just money that we have. It is measuring the profit because we can't just say money is a value. We have to say what that money is, is measuring. And so that and so that money is measuring profit. So that's actually what the money is measuring. That's the changing values profit. But then what is the other changing value? What is the relationship with profit? And the relationship with the profit is the number of uses of the machine because we're saying you profit $135 per use of the machine. So the changing values are how many times you use the machine and how much profit you make. So we have to think about which one depends on the other. Well, profit depends on how many uses the machine gets. So X is the number of uses of the machine and Y is the profit. And so let's talk about the different information or data that we're given. So we want to see, do we have any ordered pairs that we can make? Is there any slope that we can identify a Y intercept, that sort of stuff. So here, we don't really have points because there's no relationship, there's no association between like this many uses of the machine gets you this much profit, this many uses of the machine gets you this much profit, etc. But it does say we have $135 per use of the machine. The per use part is the key there. When we say per use, that's saying for every use you get of the machine, you profit $135. So that is, in essence, a language of slope that's describing how your profit is changing as the use of the machine is changing. So it's describing change in X, one use of the machine, gives you a change in the Y, the profit. So in this case, the slope, the M, is 135. Because that's the money per one use of the machine or it's 135 over one, but you can just write 135. And so there's not really any ordered pairs, but we can talk about the y-intercept. So with the y-intercept, remember that's when the x is zero. In this case, x being zero is the number of uses of the machine. So if we have zero uses of the machine, what's our initial or starting profit? Well, if we look at this, they initially spend $12,000 on the machine. So that's a negative profit because that cost them money and there was no uses of the machine. So the Y intercept, the B here, we can just say is negative 12,000. This is the Y intercept. And so we can turn that into an equation. We have the slope, we have the Y intercept. So in Y equals MX plus B, the point slope form, we can write Y is equal to the slope which is 135 times x plus the y-intercept. The y-intercept's negative, so it'd be minus 12,000. And there we go. That's an equation in point-slope form of this relationship between profit and uses of the machine. So if the medical office used the machine 100 times, we can figure out how much profit they would have. Well, that's y equals, saying it's 100 times, they're using the machine that many times that we're saying X is 100. So you plug in 100 for X. So we have 135 times X, which is 100 minus the 12,000. And then from here, it's just a matter of simplifying do the order of operations. 135 times 100 is 13,500 minus the 12,000. And then when we do that, we should get 1,500. But remember, this is in context, so we have to say what it's representing. It's representing money or profit. So we put the dollar sign there. And the next part is asking how many uses of the machine are required for the medical office to break even. Well, we have to talk about or think about what does break even mean? Break even, 
essentially means that you make as much as you spent. Or different ways of thinking about it is that your profit is zero. So that's saying that your profit or your Y is zero. So if we put zero in for Y, we have zero is equal to 135 X minus 12,000. And now we need to solve for X or the number of uses of the machine in order to get that break even point. So we want to get X by itself. So we add 12,000. So on the left hand side here, we have zero plus 12,000 is 12,000 is equal to 135 X we get X by itself. You divide by 135 and those divide to one and divide by 135 on the other side. And then we throw this in the calculator. We should end up getting X is about 88.89. However, in this scenario, we can't have a decimal part or a fraction of using the machine. Right, like that's putting someone in the machine and then saying, well, we got half your results. Here's half of it. Have a good day. No, we, ha we can only use full uses. So we should always round up in this case to X being 89 uses of the machine. On the next example, we have a weather balloon is rising eight feet per second. After 20 seconds, it is 160 feet high. So let's first identify the two variables that we have in this situation what the changing quantities are. And we see that we have seconds or time over here. So we're measuring time in seconds as one of the changing quantities. And then the height in feet is the other changing quantity. So we can think about which one depends on the other. Well, time is usually the independent variable because time doesn't really depend or is affected by other things. However, the height depends on the time since the balloon was launched or since it started rising. So X is time. And if we want, we can specify in seconds. And then the Y or the dependent variable is the height. And we can also specify that and say in feet. So looking at the information that we have here, well, we have that the balloon is rising eight feet per second. So there's that word per again, I'll highlight it. So per second is often is an indication of slope, it's telling you what the changing amount or the the rate of change of the height is relative to time. So for every second, so per second, the balloon is rising eight feet per usually means there's some sort of ratio or dividing going on relative to the quantities. So the slope here when it says eight feet per second, it's like saying eight feet per divided one second. So this is the slope here is eight feet per second. And we can actually just jump down to number three, there's still more to do in number two, but we can interpret that in terms of the context of this problem. So the slope what it's saying, well, it's it's exactly saying what the question statement or the problem statement is saying is that the balloon rises eight feet when time increases by one second. So it's really saying the same thing. I just said in more words. And so we, we got that part down. The slope is coming from eight feet per second. Now the other part is after 20 seconds, the balloon is 160 feet high. So this is, in fact, a relationship between two quantities. 20 seconds is associated or related with 160 feet high. So we have an X value, a time, associated with a Y value, the height. So we can create a point out of this, which the point is 20, that's the X, and then the height or the Y is 60. So we also have the point 2160. And there are different ways of thinking about and going about writing this equation or a lot of these equations for these word problems. So it's not like my one way is the best or perfect way. It's just one way of seeing it. And so if we want, we could write this in the point slope form. So let's say we have y minus y1, which is 160, is equal to the slope m, which is, we write it as eight feet per second here, but it's really just 
eight is a nice simple way to do it when we're doing the algebra times the quantity x minus x1, which is 20. So that's the point slope form. Now let's see what happens when we get it into the slope intercept form. So we want to get it in the slope intercept form. We add 160. And then we add 160 on the other side. And then we distribute the 8 into the quantity x minus 20. So let's see what we get when we do all that. So we have y by itself now. And that's equal to distribute the 8. 8x minus 8 times 20 is 160. Well, then we still have that plus 160 on the outside there. And now you can see that this will actually simplify nicely. We have y is equal to negative 160 plus 160. Those add to 0. So it's just 8x. So what that's really saying is that the y-intercept, or the b in the slope-intercept form, is just 0. And what that means in this context is that the balloon starts at a height of 0. It starts on the ground. So let's answer some of these questions about predicting values in the future. How high will the balloon be after 7 seconds? Well, 7 seconds, we have to think, is that giving us an x value or is that giving us a y value? Seconds is an x value. So we're saying x is equal to 7. And then we just plug in 7 into the equation for x. So we have y is equal to 8 times x, which we're saying x is 7. And this is just nice and easy. y is equal to 8 times 7, so 56. We have a result here. And we have to remember, think about what is the unit or what is this measuring? It's measuring height in feet. So this is 56 feet. So after seven seconds, the balloon will be 56 feet high. And then we can also ask or figure out how long it will take for the balloon to reach 250 feet. And so that 250 feet that we're given, that is a y value. It's talking about height. So y is equal to 250. And on these other ones, I haven't mentioned it, but it's asking, when we say how high here, it's asking us to find the height or find y. On this other one, it's asking us how long, which means it's asking us to find the time or to find x. So it's good and a uh, useful step to identify what are we given. In this case, it's the y. And then what are we looking for? In this case, it's the x. So let's plug in 250 for y and then solve for the x. So we have 250, or the y, is equal to 8 times x. Solve for x. This is a nice one-step equation. Divide by 8 to get x by itself. Those divide to 1. And then divide by 8 on the other side to keep it equal. And then 250 divided by 8 is about 31.25 seconds. And this one is OK to round to the decimals or to include the decimals because you can have decimals or fractions of seconds. On the other one, the previous problem where it was talking about uses of a machine, you can't really have a fraction or portion of a use of a machine. So the next one here is asking about uh, a local swimming pool charges $10 for membership fee and 50 cents per visit. So you pay this initial $10 to get the membership. Each time you go, you pay 50 cents. So the two variables we have in this situation, we have to think about, okay, there's money going on. So what is that money measuring? Well, it's mostly measuring the cost to you or the total cost after different visits. And the other quantity is how many visits. So the relationship here is your cost related to how many visits that you go to the pool. And so thinking about which one's x, which one's y, or which one depends on the other, the cost depends on how many visits you have. So the cost is the dependent or the y variable. So this is the, I'll say total cost, because we're looking at cost overall. And then the x is the number of visits to the pool. So let's take the information, the data that we have, and see if we can identify any or repairs or the slope or the y-intercept. So looking at this first part, the local swimming pool charges $10 for a membership fee. So that's your initial cost. Before you even visit the pool, you have to pay $10. So your cost is going to be $10 no matter what. You can think of that as 
if your visits are zero, right, if X is zero, then your cost is $10. I forgot to put cost up there. If your cost is $10 before you do any visits, that's like saying what your Y intercept is. So the Y intercept, right, this is when you have zero visits. This is the $10. And the next part here is 50 cents per visit. There's that word per again. That's describing a ratio. So you pay 50 cents per one visit. So that's describing the cost for each visit that you have, or it's describing that, that rate of change. So we can say that the slope, the M, is 50 cents, put it in the units, 50 cents per one visit. So we have enough information to write an equation in the slope intercept form. We have the Y intercept, that's 10, and we have the slope, which is 50 cents. So let's write this as y equals m, the slope, which is 50 cents. So I'm going to write 0 0.5 or 0 0.50. It's all the same. x plus b. So y equals mx plus b. The b or the y-intercept is 10 here. So there we go. That's our equation in slope-intercept form. That's describing or modeling the relationship between number of visits to the total cost of the pool. So the meaning of the slope in this context, it's essentially the same wording that you have up here. So the total cost increases by 50 cents when visits increase by one. So now let's answer some of these modeling or predicting questions. So how much will you end up paying after 23 visits? So this is asking how much you'll end up paying. So that question there, how much will you end up paying? This is asking us to find Y, to find the cost. And the next part is saying, or giving us 23 visits. So this is telling us X is 23. So all we have to do here is just plug in 23 into the equation and then solve for Y. So Y is equal to 0 0.5 times 23 plus 10. The input is 23. So now let's simplify or solve this right hand side here. So 0 0.5 times 23. Let's just get some more practice with this calculator. So we're doing 0 0.5 times 23. Oh, that gives us 11.5. Hit enter. So we have 11.5 plus 10. And then this will give us 11.5 plus 10 is 21.5. You have to remember what is the value measuring here, the 21.5. Well, that is the cost. So we have to put the dollar sign on there. So after 23 visits, your total cost will be $21.50. So let's say you have $25 budgeted for the swimming pool. And you want to figure out how many times you can visit the pool. So you have budgeted $25. So this is giving us that Y or the cost that we're willing to spend is 25. And then we're asked how many times can you visit the pool? And this is asking us to find x, to find the number of visits. So we plug in 25 for y, and then we solve for x. So we have 25 is equal to 0.5x plus 10. Now to solve for x, we subtract 10 on both sides. And then we have 15 is equal to 0.5x, and then divide by 0.5 on both sides. And this should give us that X is 30 and 30. What, what is 30 counting? Well, 30 is counting the number of visits. So for this next one, we have Mac and cheese costs 59 cents per box and 20 boxes cost $11 and 80 cents. So again, this one, the X value is the number of boxes in particular, the number of boxes that you purchase. And then the Y value is the cost of those boxes. And so the data and information here, we kind of have extra data or extra information that we don't really need. We don't really need that 20 boxes cost $11.80. All we really need is that one box costs 59 cents because there's no like Y intercept. There's no initial cost of buying mac and cheese. It's just you pay per box. So we're paying per box. So if X is the number of boxes, then the Y, the cost is 59 cents or 0.59 
per x or times x, the number of boxes. So we want to figure out how many boxes. So we want to figure out how much will 13 boxes cost. So how much is asking us to find the cost, y, and then 13 boxes is telling us that x is equal to 13. So when we do that, we plug in 13 in for x. So we have y is equal to 0.59 times 13. And then we have y is equal to, let's check this in the calculator again, 0.59 times 13. Hit enter. And there we go. That is 7.67. So we have 7.67 is what y is equal to when x is 13. But what is that measuring? Well, y is the cost. So that's measuring money. And the next one, you have $24. So that's giving us that Y, the cost that we're willing to spend is $24. And now we're asking how many boxes that we can buy. So that's asking us to find X. So we plug in 24 for Y and then we solve for X. So 24 is equal to 0.59 X. And then what we want to do is we want to get X by itself. So divide by 0.59 that divides to one. So divide by 0.59 on the other side to keep it equal. And then let's check in Desmos again. So we're doing 24 divided by 0.59 and we get 40.678. So we have X is approximately 40.68. But think about the context here. X is representing number of boxes. You can't go to the store and buy half a box or 0.68 boxes of mac and cheese. You have to buy boxes in whole numbers. So we would round this to x is equal to. Now let's think about how we would round this. The situation is that we have $24 to spend. If we round this up using natural rounding, this would round up to 41 boxes. But 41 boxes would be more money than $24. We can see in the calculator, 41 boxes, if they cost 59 cents each, multiply by 59, that's going to be more than the $24. It's 19 cents more. So this is more than we can afford if we have $24 to spend. So we wouldn't round up with natural rounding. We would round down because of the context. So we would use 40 boxes. So then the last situation here is an employee begins with a salary of $21,000 and their employer tells them that after 11 years, they will be making $37,500. If we're assuming linear growth, we want to figure out an equation for this and answer some questions. So the two variables we have are time or number of years worked and their salary. So time is usually the independent salary depends on how long this person's been there. So we have time. In particular, the years worked as the independent variable, and then the dependent variable is salary. So for this one, we need to organize the data. Um, we don't really have a slope in particular, because all we have is that they're starting with 21,000, and then after 11 years, they'll be making 37,500. So the 21,000 is kind of like the y-intercept. That's your initial when you have zero years worked, your salary is going to be 21,000. So the y-intercept is, I'm going to write it as a point. So let's say zero and 21,000. And then we actually have another point here. So after 11 years, 11 years is an x value that's associated with the y value of 37,500. So we have another point of 11 for the x and 37,500 for the y. So now that we have these two points, we can use them to get the slope. So to get the slope, remember we do the change in the y is divided by the change in the x or y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So let's find the change in the y's, that's 37,500 minus 21,000. And then in the denominator, we have 11 minus zero. Now it's important, I didn't label x1, y1. The important part is to make sure that the points line up top to bottom. So the 37,500 is associated related with the 11. So those are lined up first. And then second, the ones that are lined up are the 21,000 and the zero. Those are the related values in the points. 
And then when we do this, this gives us in the numerator 37,500 minus 21,000. That is 16,500. And then in the denominator, it's 11 minus 0, which is 11. And then if we actually do this division, let's see, 16,500 divided by 11, hit enter, and that gives us a nice round 1,500. So we have 1,500, but what is this representing? This is money in the numerator. And then, so the 1,500 is money, but in the denominator, this is by years. And so we can use this information. So we have the y-intercept here. We have the m or the slope here. So we can put this into a slope-intercept equation. So we have y is equal to m. So y equals mx plus b. The m or the slope is the 1500 times x plus the b, which is the y-intercept. That's their initial salary of 21,000. You could also throw it into the point slope form using one of the points and then simplify it and you get the same thing. So the meaning of the slope in this context is that they get a $1,500 or $1,500 raise each year. So now that we have the equation, this is the big part to being able to model and to predict things into the future. We want to figure out how much they will be making after four years. So this question, how much they will be making, is asking us to find salary, which is y. And then it says after four years, this is telling us x is four. So we plug four into the equation, and then we solve for what the y is. So we have y is equal to 1,500 times x, but the x is four plus 21,000 on the outside. So when we throw this into the calculator, let's see. We have 1,500 times 4 plus the 21,000, and we get 27,000. Hit enter on that. So this is 27,000, but again, remember, what is 27,000 representing here? Y is salary, so 27,000 is money, so we'll put the dollar sign on there. And the next part is asking how long will they have to work in order to earn a salary of 40,000? So this is asking how long... So this is asking us to find X, and we want to earn $40,000. So this is telling us that the Y or the salary is $40,000. And then we need to solve for X. So let's plug this in. 40,000 is equal to 1,500 times X plus 21,000. Now let's solve for X. To solve for X, subtract 21,000. Forgot a zero on the edge here. So then we subtract 21,000 on the other side. So this adds to zero on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, 40,000 minus 21,000 will give us 19,000. And then 19,000 is equal to 1,500 times x. That's what's left over. Get x by itself. We divide by 1,500. Those divide to 1. And then divide by 1,500 on the other side. And then we can see what that is. If you throw it in the calculator, we should get that X is about 12.67. But we're talking about years, and we're assuming that they only get a salary raise each year. So at the start of the new year, they get a raise. So let's just assume that we're only using whole numbers here. So in this case, we would round up to 13, and that's 13 years.